Do you need near production quality plastic parts quickly and economically? Find out why polyurethane vacuum casting may be just the solution for you. Hello and welcome, this is Gordon Stiles, the president and founder of Star Rapid. I've been involved with rapid prototyping, tool making, machining and new product development for more than 35 years and I'm happy to be back with you once again for another installment of Serious Engineering for Serious Engineers. Serious Engineering. Here at Star, we just love making these videos. Personally, I have always seen myself as an educator a teacher, if you will. So for me, the Serious Engineering series has always been about passing on all this wonderful engineering knowledge to the next generation. If you're as passionate about engineering as I am, which I know you are, because that's why you're here, then please, please, please share these videos with any lecturers, teachers, or trainers that you might know. And let's get the engineering love out to these students and apprentices who could benefit from the knowledge. Thank you. And now for something completely different. As you know, I've spent billions of years floating through the depths of intergalactic space, being stardust and all, so I'm pretty comfortable being around and working with vacuum. And vacuum, despite being the very definition of nothing, quantum science aside, also happens to be useful for all kinds of some things. For example, cleaning crumbs from sofa cushions, helping secret agents cling to skyscrapers to foil international terrorism, supercharging the last of the V8 interceptors, and making really nice low volume parts and prototypes. But master styles, you say, how can something come from nothing? That is the age old question, my young apprentice, is it not? Allow me to be your guide to making polyurethane vacuum cast parts. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as urethane casting, which is not technically correct, but for some reason you Yanks out there say it all the time. <clears throat> Disclaimer, this script was actually written by a Yank, not the limey this time, okay? The process I will show you today is the one we use at Star, but there may be slightly different techniques out there. If you have some suggestions, we'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. No matter the variations, vacuum casting is a great solution for rapid prototyping and new product development. If you haven't seen the quality for yourself, you'll be amazed at the beautiful results you can achieve, and from start to finish it takes only around 7 to 10 days to complete a typical project. And that's without having to invest in hard tooling. So if you need a few parts for prototype testing, display models, proof of concept, or a crowdfunding campaign, and they need to be just like the real thing, this is for you. 1. Master Patterns Vacuum casting starts with a master pattern. Technically, they can be any physical solid that's a copy of the finished part. It needs to be rigid enough to hold its shape at temperatures of about 70 degree centigrade or above. You can CNC machine master patterns if you want to, but we don't normally recommend it. The reason is that CNC milling makes radius concave corners using round cutters, so the master pattern ends up not being a complete facsimile of the 3D CAD model. We only really use CNC machining for master patterns when the parts have very thick walls or sections, or we're making a gloss or clear part. For gloss parts, we make a PMMA master model and hand polish it to a very high gloss. Normally, for most jobs, we prefer stereolithography SLA 3D printed master models. SLA is fast, inexpensive, accurate, and it produces an excellent surface finish. This is important because vacuum casting will accurately reproduce all the surface details, including the ones you don't want. So it really pays to take your time at this stage, to carefully sand and prime the master pattern to get it just right. If you want a texture on your final castings, we can put the texture on the master model using paint and it will get picked up faithfully by the silicone rubber mold. 2. The silicone mold. Once we have the master pattern, we'll prepare it to go into the casting box to make the silicone rubber mold. We do this by adding a split line to the master model using 3M tape, often with a black line on the edge, so that we can see it inside the silicon tool later. We also add some 1.5mm diameter rods that will become venting holes and a much larger rod in the range of 10 to 20 millimeters that will become the casting gate in the silicone tool. And here's a little rule for you. Always gate low, vent high, just like metal sand casting. We also use steel and aluminium cores sometimes to define areas in the tool that will be too weak for silicone rubber and can easily get torn off. We put these cores into the master model before the tool is poured. They then remain as part of the silicone tool once in operation. Then we make up casting boxes to hold the liquid silicone when it's poured around the pattern. 
We join our plates together with hot glue so they can be easily disassembled later. Boxes should only be a little bit bigger than the pattern itself to avoid wasting material and to make removal easier. Now, while the casting boxes are being prepared, the silicone rubber is being mixed with a hardener inside a vacuum chamber, which also removes gases from solution. Not many vacuum casting companies pre-vacuum their silicone, but I can tell you it really makes a difference to the quality of the mold. The master patterns are suspended in a casting box at a point roughly equidistant to all the sides. The silicone is poured in carefully from one corner, which helps to avoid introducing any air pockets. If you try and rush the pour, it will be like a video of a dam breaking in slow motion. Everything just gets swept away. Three, curing. We then put the boxes into a vacuum casting machine to remove bubbles and trapped air. And then they're cured in a 40 degree centigrade oven for around eight to 16 hours, depending upon the size of the tool. But Master Styles, you ask, where are my copies? Patience, my young Padawan, patience you must learn. Four, opening the mold. Now we need our Jedi skills. The mold needs to be opened along the split line with a series of incisions with a scalpel. And to do this, it helps to use a strong directional light source so that the inside of the mold is clearly illuminated. And always use a brand new blade unless you want to cut yourself. More resistance, more force. Notice that we make jagged wavy cuts on this seam. This helps us to reseal the mold in the correct orientation later. Sometimes we're cutting to a tape split line that has a black edge, and in some cases, we're landing the scalpel directly onto the model, which is a highly skilled technique. Once the mold is opened, which can take a bit of muscle, we remove the master pattern and expose the empty cavity within, a perfect negative image of the original. Ta-da! <coughs> mm. To make copies, you need pourable polyurethane vacuum casting resin. There are many formulations available, and they basically mimic the mechanical properties of standard plastic injection molding resins like nylon, polycarbonate, or ABS, and even soft TPE elastomers with durometers from 30 up to 83 Shore A. These resins can also be pigmented in advance so the color is molded into the part. We like to warm up our resins to 40 degrees centigrade days in advance of use, and we also regularly turn the bottles over to mix up the resin to avoid crystallization. Also, after pouring out our resins into the casting cups, we make sure that the bottle is backfilled with argon gas before putting it back into the storage oven. This keeps it from absorbing moisture, which is a blowing agent for polyurethane. Not a good idea unless you want to make foam. And believe me, this is probably one of the biggest hacks in this process. Now we preheat our new silicone mold halves to around 70 degrees centigrade. Then we spray on some silicone release agent, put the two halves of the mold back together and staple them shut. Then the tool goes into the vacuum casting machine. We insert the pouring funnels, connectors and tubes and put the A and B parts of the resin into the pouring cups. Now we are ready to pull a vacuum. With the door shut, we start the vacuum pump and degas the resins, which needs about 10 minutes. Then we pour one cup into the other, stir for a little longer, and then we're ready to pour. The two resins are poured down the funnel, into the tubes, and then into the cavity. Once resin comes up the vents onto the top of the mold, we're ready to release the vacuum. Any bubbles that were still in the molding then collapse to about 1 50th of their vacuumed size. And the gas in the tiniest bubbles often gets reabsorbed back into solution. That minimizes porosity in the parts, and that is the real reason for the vacuum. After curing, we open the mold and voila! Once we cut off the gates and risers, we have a perfect copy of the original pattern. Silicon molds can be used for up to about 15 to 20 castings before they need to get replaced. This is because they chemically break down when exposed to the resin and the silicone turns white and hard and eventually crumbles. So there you have it, a primer on how to use polyurethane vacuum casting for rapid prototypes and low volume parts. If we miss something or you'd like to know more, please drop us a comment below. Don't forget to ring the bell, like us and subscribe, and of course, always use the force for good and never for evil. And never forget that we are the people that do serious engineering for serious engineers. Serious engineering.